Hey guys, today we are back with episode number 37 of Truck History. On today's episode, we will be looking at the history of Corbett trucks. Now, let's get started. Corbett trucks were the inspiration of Richard J. Corbett, an ambitious young man from rural Vance County, North Carolina. After an internship in the tobacco business under J.P. Taylor of Henderson, Richard J. Corbett became a buyer and a seller of Leaf Tobacco, representing Taylor in his birthplace of Enfield, North Carolina, and in Henderson, where he settled permanently in 1894. The following year, he went into business on his own. Corbett foresaw the big companies dominating the tobacco industry, so in 1899, he decided to enter the buggy manufacturing business. In 1899, there were four buggy builders in Henderson. Eight years later, Corbett had bought all three of them. Initially building horse-drawn buggies to haul agricultural products, Corbett's company began to produce passenger cars and trucks, and later buses and military vehicles. The company adopted assembly line production and that, combined with successful marketing efforts, transformed the small Henderson operation into the leader in North Carolina's auto industry. In 1905, Corbett built his first automobile, which he called a motor buggy. Automobiles went into full production in 1907. He imported laborers from Detroit so he would have workers knowledgeable about automobiles. But this only added to his costs, and he was losing money on every car he sold. Corbett's cars and trucks sold well in the South, but the company was unable to keep pace with the mass production operations in Detroit. In 1910, Corbett built his first truck, and the profit picture began to change, and a few years later made a big decision. In 1913, he decided to forget automobiles and become a full-time truck builder. His first trucks were the conventional chain drive and then expanded until he became known as the largest truck manufacturer in the South thanks to large contracts with the State Highway Department and the U.S. military. For most of the next 40 years, the company made money building trucks and trailers. The trailers included vans, drop frame vans, and flatbeds up to 36 feet in length. Most of the large motor carriers of the Carolinas came to be Corbett customers. In 1917, the company built North Carolina's first school buses, and he built his first dump truck. The Corbett company always made money, except when it was building automobiles. From 1917 to 1918, it supplied 4,000 trucks to the U.S. Army and Navy. It started building 4x4s and 6x6s for the Army in the early to mid-1930s. In 1934, Corbett bought obsolete automobile sheet metal from the Auburn Motors Company and used it for the front ends of its lightest trucks, those in the 11 to 13,000 pound gross vehicle weight category. They were extremely handsome trucks. None of these are known to have survived. Every major fleet in North and South Carolina bought the pre-1940 Corbett tractor. From 1939 to 1945, Corbett designed and built over 3,250 SD6, 6-ton, 6x6 prime movers for the U.S. Army. These trucks were equipped with either the 779 or the 855 cubic inch Hercules six-cylinder gasoline engine. They were used in every theater of operation during World War II. Corbett lacked production capacity for all the trucks needed, so White, Brockway, Ward, LaFrance, and FWD all built the same or very similar trucks. Altogether, over 10,000 of these trucks were built by the five manufacturers. One reason for Corbett's success with the military was that the small company was flexible and able to do quick modifications. The army demanded an all-steel cab, so Corbett discontinued the wooden frame from the 30s and built nothing but all-steel cabs from then on. The early 20th century was a highly competitive time for America's trucking industry. There have been more than 600 named truck builders in the United States since 1900. Many builders merged with larger firms while others were in business only a few years. Corbett, the South's only truck assembly plant, survived the Great Depression and World War II because its founder emphasized practicality, power, performance, efficiency, quality, and on-time delivery. Unlike their competition, Corbett's were plain and simple trucks that could be built with local labor, not Detroit technicians. World War II was Corbett's highest point. However, post-war years were its lowest. After the war, weak demand, labor issues, and an aging founder with no family successor spelled trouble for Corbett. In 1946, Corbett built two prototypes of a huge 8x8 truck, the T-33, for the Army. This truck looks modern even by 21st century standards. It carried 1 4th inch armor plate and was 131 inches tall and 114 inches wide. A 450 horsepower radial aircraft engine was mounted in the rear. The T-33s were said to be the second largest trucks in the world at the time. 
Corbett's largest post-war production year was 1946, when it built 600 trucks. About this time, Corbett played a role in one of the biggest moving jobs ever. A Corbett truck pulled Howard Hughes' 75-ton seaplane, the Spruce Goose, from Hughes Aircraft at Culver City, California, to appear at Long Beach 28 miles away. At the time, this was the largest bulk load ever pulled over the highway. The state of North Carolina was one of Corbett's best customers. They still had many 4x4 Corbett's when the company went out of business in 1955 and were to operate some Corbett's into the 1970s. They also owned Corbett crane carriers. In the early 1950s, Corbett built 10 very tall cab over tractors for Turner Transfer of Greensboro, North Carolina, a specialized machinery mover. They could seat four or five men across the cab and a man could sleep on the floor in the space beneath the windshield. These trucks were powered by 8-cylinder English Gardener diesels. They are probably still the tallest trucks ever used in a highway application. They were also an early example of a tilt cab. One of the largest users of Corbett road tractors was Riss & Company of Kansas City. Riss bought tractors completely lettered and road ready. They sent drivers to Henderson to take delivery of tractors at the factory. If they bought trailers as well, they could pick up freight on the way home. Corbett employed about 325 people at its height. The engineering department consisted of no more than five men. Corbett always built its own cabs and also made its own frames using 5 16th inch chrome magnes when most of their competition was using 1 4th inch carbon steel. Frame rails were bought from Parrish with Corbett fabricating and drilling the frames. The assembly line moved slowly with the first truck pulling the rest up the line by chain. Every new Corbett went through a dynamometer test and road test and was ready for work with no further preparation. Corbett used mostly Continental gasoline engines and Cummins and Hercules diesels. It got the first 50 JBS 600 150 horsepower supercharged engines from Cummins circa 1950, but stopped using them because of the problems they developed. Fleets tried to do the work with them they did with larger diesels, and they just didn't hold up. In the late 1940s and early 50s, Corbett even built farm tractors. They were similar to cockshuts in design and came in three versions, gasoline, kerosene, and diesel. Most were exported to Brazil, but at least a few were sold in the US. One of these tractors is still in use after nearly 60 years by its original owner. Another example of Corbett quality and longevity was Geraldine, a 1951 Corbett diesel sold new by dealer R.E. Daniel to the Daniels Company of Springfield, Missouri. By the early 80s, she had run up 2.6 million miles in 48 states. In 1984, she was sold to a dump truck operator. By 1952, R.J. Corbett was nearly 80 years old and in declining health. The son he hoped would run the company had died. The Corbett family owned over 90% of the company's stock. Mr. Corbett, a fine gentleman respected by all, had discussed continuation of the company with various employees but it appeared no long-term successor could be found. So, in December of that year, the company was sold to United Industrial Syndicate of New York City, a liquidation specialist. Corbett built its last truck in 1953, though some were sold as 1954 models. In 1954, Corbett built only 40 trucks, a few farm tractors, and some travel drills. Everything had been liquidated by 1955, and the company closed. After Corbett closed, Wallace White, former Corbett service manager, and Gus Backman, former parts manager, continued to sell parts to Corbett owners from one of the old factory buildings. They even assembled one complete new truck in 1958, but decided the demand wasn't sufficient to warrant building more. The Orrin Roanoke Corporation of Roanoke, Virginia, acquired a number of the last Corbett chassis built, along with cabs and sheet metal. Orin, a fire apparatus manufacturer, produced about 125 Corbett look-alike fire trucks, some before Corbett folded and some after. The last of these fire trucks was not built until 1963. So that wraps up Corbett's history. Thanks guys for watching. Before you leave, like the video, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. What did you think of Corbett trucks? If you want to stay up to date on all content coming your way, tune into the Chrome Corner Wednesdays at noon with our host Dave Coleman. Thanks again guys for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, if your rig don't shine, you don't know Jack.